Welcome to all of you joining us on CBSNews.com for this live question and answer session on the Ebola virus. The news today, of course, was that the first Ebola patient in the United States died earlier today. Thomas Duncan died of the Ebola virus in a Dallas hospital which has raised a lot of questions today by people who are concerned about the prospects of contagion in this country. Joining us is Dr. John LaPook, as always here. And John, a number of people have sent in questions to us on our Facebook page, and let's just go through them because they're smart. Chase Gregory asked, how are doctors preparing for this disease? Some of us live in small towns, and I don't see our doctors getting ready. Yeah, well, people are gearing up all over the country. I know there have been directives sent out. I've gotten myself, since I'm a physician, uh, directives from the CDC and from my local Department of Health. I can tell at NYU Langone Medical Center, where I'm a professor, they're actually having drills. They're, they're sending in secret shoppers who are pretending to have symptoms of Ebola, and then they're pretending to be from West Africa to see, are they being asked the correct questions. Then in addition, they're having full-blown uh, drills of people saying, this person doesn't have Ebola, but we're going to pretend they have Ebola. Come in and see, are all the protocols being followed? Well, that sounds great, but when Thomas Duncan came to the hospital in Dallas, they sent him home, not suspecting for a moment that he had Ebola, even though he told the admitting nurse there that he'd been in Liberia. Yeah, and Scott, we're seeing the difference between protocol and reality. And of course, I've seen this. I've been a doctor for 34 years. I've seen this all the time. I've seen patients, uh, I've seen uh, people I'm training, uh, fellows, interns, residents who are doing procedures and they're supposed to be wearing masks and they don't wear masks. And I have to just tell them to do that, even though the patient could have an infectious disease. Now we have something like Ebola, which nobody, pretty much no doctor has seen in the United States. And you have these protocols, and there's going to be a big difference between what the protocols say to do and what they're actually done. Now, in the case of Dallas, hopefully now there's been enough publicity. People aren't going to make that same mistake, although you never know. But I think that there are going to be new mistakes made because I think statistically, Scott, we have to expect in terms of what's the next case scenario that there are going to be more and more people in West Africa who are going to get infected. People are going to come to the United States. There are going to be individual cases of Ebola, very important, individual cases, but that doesn't mean an outbreak. So Dr. Frieden has said with the, all the right uh, controls, we can isolate it, stop it in its track. But what that's going to mean is that these emergency rooms, one case at a time, are going to see patients. And I suspect that they're not totally prepared uh, because they haven't done this before. Before we get to the next question, let me bring in our correspondent, Manuel Bajorcas, who is in Dallas covering the story there. Manuel, we heard uh, today that a Dallas County Sheriff's deputy was admitted to the hospital. He had uh, been inside the apartment that Duncan had been living in, although he had no contact with Duncan. And now he's in the hospital with flu-like symptoms. What can you tell us about that? There he is arriving. That's right, Scott. This is a deputy who uh, was in the apartment before it was decontaminated. He was part of the response there today. We're told that he showed up at an urgent care center in a Dallas suburb, the Dallas suburb of Frisco, with an upset stomach. Out of an abundance of caution, officials said they would treat the case, or at least evaluate, it, uh, evaluate him and test him for the Ebola virus. Now, they said they believe his risk is low, but the fact that they have acted so quickly to get him to this hospital for evaluation gives you a sense of the concern out there. While we're not seeing people walking around Dallas with masks over their faces or anything like that, it seems that even beyond the 48 cases that have been identified here of people who may have had some exposure to Duncan, there are people who may have been associated with this case uh, in, in in, in, in less of a direct form who are, are, are concerned about this. And we saw that play out today with that deputy. The uh, Centers for Disease Control said today of all the people they're following around the Duncan case, no one has become symptomatic of Ebola so far. But, you know, Manuel, I'm curious, how are folks in Dallas treating all of this? They, they have a death there now, and I'm wondering how the community is taking it. Well, the death def definitely heightened the fears around all of this, although officials have been going out of their way to interact with even quarantine family members to prove what they've been saying all along is that you cannot get this unless you have direct contact with the bodily fluids of someone who is infected. There is a lot of talk out there, a lot of chatter, a lot of concern, a lot of 
even fear as much as officials have tried to dampen that. Uh, it's definitely top of mind for people. How could it not be? We haven't seen panic. Officials are trying to make sure there is no panic. Uh, but every time people have some kind of symptom, regardless of the illness, they're going to think, oh no, is this Ebola? They're going to try to get help. That is something that officials actually say, hey, we'll deal with that. We'll have the influx of people just so that we know there are no new cases out there. Manuel, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. John LaPook, let's come back to some of these really insightful questions uh, that have come from our viewers onto our Facebook page. Jennifer Stovall wrote, can a normal healthy person fight off Ebola or does a healthy immune system not matter? No, actually, in the, in the first nine months experience uh, that the New England Journal published about two weeks ago, uh, it turns out that the younger people do do better. The older you are, the worse you do. But you can survive, and what's interesting is we have about a 50% survival rate, depending upon the statistics you believe. And that gives us an unprecedented new tool, which is you've got 50% of those people who are probably immune to Ebola, and people are talking about using them for all sorts of reasons, including going in and taking care of people who potentially have Ebola. Now, the fatality rate in West Africa under relatively primitive medical conditions is about 50%. What would you expect here in the United States with modern medicine? I think dramatically lower. I mean, we've had six people treated in America. We do, unfortunately, have one death. The other five have not died. And uh, as Dr. Paul Farmer told me very eloquently, Ebola has never collided with modern medicine. And what that means is that in something like Ebola, the way it kills you, the way it devastates your body is by initially turning off your own immune system and also creating an inflammatory response throughout the body that wreaks havoc. And one of the things that happens is you get profuse diarrhea. I mean, I'm talking about liters and liters of fluid loss a day. What that means is you can get dehydration, lack of blood flow to key organs, and that can cause organ failure and death. Now, we know how to treat shock. We know how to treat dehydration. You give intravenous fluids, you give electrolytes, and if there's problems with bleeding, you can give clotting factors. They haven't had that luxury of that kind of treatment in West Africa. So I, I expect, and Dr. Ribner, who was the, the head of the team at Emory who treated uh, the, the people who were infected there, um, felt the same way. He said to me, I expect it to be dramatically lower here in the United States. So that you essentially have to let the virus run its course because there's no way to kill the virus, but all of those terrible symptoms that cause death are well handled and well treated in our modern hospitals. You can treat hospitals. the symptoms, but sometimes the infection does overpower the body. Now, there are some experimental treatments. There's one treatment uh, that Mr. Duncan did get that works by stopping the virus from replicating. Another uh, experimental treatment is being used that stops the genetic material, the RNA, from creating proteins. So even though you're not stopping the, the virus from replicating, you're stopping the normal machinery of the virus, and it can help it that way. Then there are, uh, you heard about ZMAP, and that's an antibody that attaches itself to the virus and stops it from entering the cell in the first place. So you're having this multi-pronged attack against the virus. We're not sure which of these is going to work. And then, of course, you've got the vaccine development, which I think is going to be very important. But I spoke to some experts about this. Nobody expects there to be enough significant amount of vaccine or treatment to be helpful in the next three or four months. Now, we got several questions along the same line, but one of the people who put it the most succinct succinctly was Arid Calderas, who says, to be safe, we should not admit any more people coming in from Africa. Just stop the travel. That's kind of a social question, right. not so much as a medical well, question. This, What's know, your the, impression of that? I, sp I was on the phone today. Funny you should ask. I was on the phone today with the American ambassador to Liberia, and I asked her this question, and she said, um, she really doesn't want that to happen because then you end up isolating the country. And th this is a country that needs back and forth travel right now in order to help it. So that's the kind of thing that's just going to make things worse in West Africa. And let's face it, if we do not get it under control in West Africa, no amount of trying to cut off the border is going to help. If the numbers are going to increase, it'll spread to the rest of Africa, eventually to the rest of the world, one by one, and then maybe even more than that. So the, at the end of the day, 
We've got to focus. I know we're worried here, and I don't discount that. I mean, I know people are afraid, and, and in, I try, try to walk the line. I'm a journalist, and I'm a doctor, and I try to get this perspective where in the middle where, on the one hand, I'm not infantilizing people and saying, oh, it's okay, nothing's going to happen. And on the other hand, I don't say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, it's hitting on, us on the head. So somewhere in the middle, um, I think, is important, and I think as part of that, people have to understand we've got to get this under control in Africa, in West Africa. Now, let's get to Elaine Mitchell's question, which is the question that everybody in the country is asking. Can Ebola spread by someone sneezing or coughing on you? Is this under control in the USA? And she says thanks in advance. Okay. Um, you're welcome in advance. And I will say that um, the CDC and, again, all the experts say it is not spread by the air. Now, what that means is it's not finely aerosolized in a way that can significantly travel in the way that the influenza virus does. If it were, if it were able to be transmitted this way, there would be tens of millions of cases of Ebola every year. In West Africa. In West Africa. Because it would have spread much it further, spread much, much faster. much faster. So that's the bottom. You can have theory and this theory and that theory, but the, but the bottom line is we would be seeing millions and millions of cases. In the United States, every year, 5 to 20 percent of people get influenza. So we're talking about, I'll do the fast math, 15 to 60 million people who would get, who get the flu every year. So um, the fact is that it has not been spread that way in West Africa. It hasn't been spread that way in previous epidemics, which, by the way, are a couple of dozen over 40 years since 1976 when it was first discovered. So um, there's no reason to think that this virus is acting differently. It's just that it's spread more widely. And the way that it is spread, what we do know about that is what? Direct contact with body fluids. And that's been shown time and time again. And that means, you know, nitty gritty, vomit, stool, diarrhea, sweat, um, and also possibly semen, sputum. So anything that could get into an open wound or something in uh, mucous membranes. So if it splashes into your mouth, in your nose, in your eyes. So unless somebody, I asked the CDC about this quote, what if somebody sneezes right into your face and the fluid goes right into your mouth? And, and the representative from the CDC said, when was the last time somebody sneezed right into your face? Of course, I said that and then somebody tweeted, yesterday at Walmart's. So, you know, I guess. So possible but not likely in I, that particular illustration. I think the truth is that people, that is not a way that uh, is in any kind of significant way, you know, Dr. Frieden said never say never. Um, if somebody, I suppose, had fluid that had the virus in it and somehow got it directly into your mouth, nose, or eyes, yes, theoretically that could spread it. But that is not the way it is spread in this epidemic and or in others. And patients are not contagious, as I understand it, until they have symptoms. That's so important. And we cannot say that enough because in the flu, you can spread it the day before you get symptoms. And that's one of the insidious things. So out it goes and you never knew you were sick. In this case, if you don't have symptoms, you cannot spread it. John, thank you very much. Dr. John LaPook, who is our resident authority on Ebola, Manuel Bajorcas in Dallas, covering the developing events there. And thank you, one and all, for joining us right here for our conversation about Ebola on CBSNews.com. There'll be much more on this story later tonight on your CBS station. We'll have the latest information right here on CBSNews.com, and you can count on more reporting tomorrow on CBS this morning and right here at the CBS Evening News. Until then, I'm Scott Pelley, CBS News in New York.